Why have there been dozens of acts of genocide since World War II? Does anybody care? Why is the sky blue? Bernard Storch was born in Poland on November 10th, 1922. He had four brothers, one of whom died of tuberculosis at the age of 11. Though anti-Semitism was a factor in pre-war Poland, Storch says he was sheltered from it and had a mostly happy childhood, even though he lived mere miles from the German border. He was the son of a World War I veteran, a lieutenant who served from 1912 to 1918. He came to the United States on April 27, 1947, but before that, he was a prisoner in a labor camp, a soldier for the Polish army who fought in the infantry and for the artillery, and a hero who helped free labor and concentration camps. Welcome to a special edition of The Prism. Bernard, thank you for speaking with us, and welcome. Thank you so much. In January 1944, the Nazis were broadcasting through the air that they killed, they killed uh, thousands of Polish officers in the Katyn forest, okay? And they were bombarding that. They were dropping leaflets on us, but we didn't trust the Nazis either. How can they kill, you know, so many soldiers with taking prisoners when, uh, you know, the, the Russia was attacked in 1941? In such a short time, unfortunately, it, it, it was the truth. It was the truth. We were 25 kilometers away. At that time, I was not wounded, but I, it, it, there were tremendous dysentery came because of the f bad water which they had, drinking water. People were dying like flies. And I was one of the guys that spent three weeks in all those uh, hospitals going with blood like a like a, for they were taking out dread people from the thing just like that from the rooms but i made it i went it made it through and uh, i saw what the infantry does they lost so many people they needed reimbursement reinforcement so i went to re register from the hospital director from the hospital to register and i found a nice jewish kid a nice jewish girl sitting at the counter they're registering, and I, but I was from the non-commissioned academy. So he says, I don't know if I'll be able to do it because it's a special force. So I don't, I don't know if she'll be able to do it. But he says, never mind, you take, 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 take a chance. I will take a chance. And sure enough, because they lost so many people and everywhere, and I had already experience, so I was able to transfer to artillery. And their artillery saved my life, really because we were not, even so we were attacked because we didn't stay, we could have stayed nine kilometers away, but we never stayed more than two, two and a half kilometers. But the, from the air, you still got attacked and everything else, but uh, we made that. So that was my first engagement. And uh, unfortunately, we lost so many casualties, but I still, we still didn't give up because we got reinforcement after that and everything else. So that was my, my first engagement against the Nazi army. It was tough because we lost, we lost 55 Jewish, uh, it was registered, 55 Jewish uh, regular soldiers there, including that one chaplain. Herschel Zabada was his name. He was from Lublin itself and graduated Lublin Yeshiva. So it was very tough because you lost a lot of friends and everything else. But it's still, you know, when you're army, you always said, you, you know, it will not happen to me. So we continued and, uh, with, this, with the next, uh, with the next uh, situation. The next situation was in January 1944, January 1944, and we started to move out. From that day on, we never retreated one single yard, always moving forward always moving forward. The winter was tremendous uh, that in that specific year. Snow like crazy. Even so, our army was equipped, you know, better than, than anybody else with moving stuff. But the snow was falling like crazy, crazy. Through the night, we had to shovel because we had to keep the road open for the, you know, for the truck to move. So we threw the shovel, and, you know, you shoveled. They, you didn't have electric... Uh, plug the way we have not, but they had those wide shovels, the shovels were like from here, oh, about 26 inches, 
wooden shovels, which is, they were not heavy. And you didn't lift it, you just moved the shovel. The, fold, the snow was very dry, it was not a wet snow. Wet snow, you couldn't do anything with that. So it was, it was continues like that until February. And February, again, we started our offensive again, moving on. And eventually, in April, we came to the Polish border. In April, we came to the Polish border and uh, and uh, started to move on and uh, closely to 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 pull it in poland and uh, and eventually eventually wind up in july we wind up in uh, uh, sobibor 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 that was the first camp which we found there we would have never knew that is a camp first of all because there were no barracks there was no nothing and uh, perhaps you know, a lot of people don't know about it, but Sobibor was a revolt. And the revolt was by the local people. Sobibor was a camp without buildings. Can you imagine? There were no buildings there. There were just buildings for collection things. Because in Sobibor, they didn't keep the people which arrived. They did not kept overnight. As soon as the transport arrived, the transport was dead a few hours later. Simple as that. They did not have any gas chambers of those those days. I mean, the the extermination camps. They did not have that. They simply poisoned them and brought them away about three kilometers away from that tank place and buried them near forested area there. And uh, fortunately, didn't last long. Didn't last long because that was in 1943. The camp was built. I think the region was built there in 1942, late 1942 and didn't last long because a revolt occurred. And thank God we had a prisoner of war, a Russian prisoner of war. Among them there were a lot of Jewish Russian prisoner of war. But the main head which was from there was Lieutenant, I remember that name. He died about six years ago. And he was originally from Rostov in Russia. And he was a lieutenant. And, and uh, uh, there were a couple of Ukrainian soldiers that took prisoner of war which they had no right to be there, but they were there, and uh, local people which were there, that's the working place. They only had 300 people always there, and they strictly meant for maintenance and for doing the dairy job and assuring the people which come in, that was the orders, that they're just going to work down there, okay? So they were, you know, they were poisoned, simply poisoned in that particular building, and then dragged away by trucks couple miles and buried there in in this in those gravesite. So revolt was there in nineteen four I ironically, you know, very strange. And the same date which I have the engagement against Nazis, October thirteenth, nineteen forty three, that's where revolt was there. They murdered eleven SS people and they shut the camp down right after that. For the three hundred people from there Two, there were couples still alive there from the the watchmen there, the Nazi watchmen. They were shut down. They were shut down, but they were still shooting and killing people. But unfortunately, a lot of people still died because there were minefield outside the camp. But luckily, the, a group of people, close to 100 people, were able to escape the, to the forest. And by the way, that Lieutenant Perharsky, he survived. A couple other survivors were there. Some of them are still alive. One of them died died immediately in Lvov, in Lublin. I will tell you the story later about that, okay? But that was the thing, and uh, from the entire group, I met a couple of them which survived, especially a woman, and as a matter of fact, she wrote a book, and I have that book from her, and uh, uh, brought into our, she was a speaker in our temple, in New City Jewish Center, and that's how I met her, and uh, she came from that area, but she was able to survive. So we're going to move ahead. You've already freed one camp. You were a prisoner of a Russian camp. So let's talk about probably something that you expected to be one of the best days, which was probably one of the hardest days when you actually got to free one of the termination camps, one of the major concentration camps. Tell me about that day and tell me how emotionally you managed to survive it. 
Okay, actually in Poland there was nobody which uh, which we were able to to liberate as as uh, as prisoner of war or any other one, because the camp actually in Maidan was the only place which they still had people. Unfortunately, just about a week before that, they were, they transported all out from the from Maidan. That that was the camp which they still had close to seven thousand people. We caught so many Nazi soldiers walking as a prisoner of war, walking because the Nazi could not, could not transport them because they were busy transporting the people from those camps still to the last camp, which is operational, was at that time was Auschwitz. But to that point, there were 7,000 7, people still there, okay? And, and as a matter of fact, there was one of the castles, there was a castle in Lublin, which they, they killed uh, uh, 500, 400-something or 500-something Christians there in that castle. They set the castle up fire, and people burned to death in that, in that thing at that particular time. So we didn't find... The first camp which we liberated, really, uh, Zobibo, but there's nothing there. I told you the story about it. The next one was Maidanek, which everything, completely everything was intact. We spent about 45 minutes in the entire camp there going through just in the beginning because they had something like 250 buildings there. Now, I'm not talking buildings, you know, high-story buildings, just sort of like, like uh, uh, which you keep the, the prisoners there, whatever you keep in them. Because it was a military base before that too. So, but in Maidanag itself was an atrocious thing to see. And we had I'm absolutely no idea what we're entering there. I spoke perfect German, so I, I read the sign Arbeit smart free and so forth and the other, and you know there you have the 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 bathhouse and and shower and everything in Germany, so I know what's going on, but so we just thought you know something some kind of a labor camp or something like that, until we entered the 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 uh, guest chambers, and guest chambers you couldn't see much, but you had the structure, and you check the structure, then then somebody came in from the outside told us that this is not just a thing. This is, a, this is a guest chamber, which they raised the guests from the top, and people died there, and, uh, but by the thousands, really. And finally, couple, couple, about half a kilometer away were the crematoriums, and the bodies were still in there. Some of the bodies were in there. There were a lot of ash, a lot of bones, and everything else. Then, the, you know, that, that was the end of that. The, 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 all the buildings were completely intact, except the, the director's house, was sort of half burnt, not completely half burnt, but everything was standing intact. Then, of course, we came to a, by a pile of of uh, of ash. Of course, didn't re realize that that would be human ash, and of course, thousands and thousands and thousands of shoes sorted out men, women, and children, and clothing and some suitcases with the name still on. So we saw that the service was there. To what degree it was, we had no idea that thousands and thousands of people were dying there. We still don't know whether it's strictly Jewish people or not. We did not know. Specifically, Maidanek was a lot of Christian. A lot of priests you know, from the area were sent to Maidanek. Intelligent, Polish intelligentsia, but the major thing was the Jews. It was for the Jews, built for the Jews, simply like that. And uh, so th 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 that was the biggest draw. And, uh, you know, to see what you saw, and especially in our cases, you know, like myself, leaving somebody behind, who knows, maybe one of them was here. It was not very pretty. It was very, very sad. But if you're on a mission, you know, what you have, you simply cannot cannot continue. You have to remember what you saw and just go on and see what you can do. So you simply cannot ignore that fact. You have to recuperate immediately. Don't forget what you saw. Remember, it's not easy. It was not easy. It was not. I didn't sleep nights because I left everybody there. Everybody there. So that, that was the only thing bad, you know, in Poland, that we did not liberate human beings. The only human beings were still liberated, were liberated in Auschwitz. And that was liberated by the fourth Ukrainian front, which were, you know, not far away, but not my direction. Unfortunately, I have the sad, sad fortune to, to liberate only dead camps. The next one would be, would be Helmno. Helmno was a small city. 
Helmand was a small city, and it was a city which also did not have any gas chambers. Helmand was built, as a matter of fact, initiated, not built, because they kept the people overnight in a church, believe it or not. They got undressed in the church, and at that time they were, you know, that we found that lady after the fact that they had buses there from the Christians there, that they had a, a German buses. They put the people in the bus naked. I was told 70 people. Was it 70? I don't know. They put 70 people in the bus and with a transport into an area, I don't know how far, about 15 minutes away they sat. And by the time they reached that place, everybody in the bus was killed. And that was the process where they were doing. 350 people died in that camp like that. And the majority of people died from city lodge in that area. So it was a very sad situation there. And, you know, and uh, we have to still go on and do. The same day, as a matter of fact, when we entered that particular place, a couple hours later, about four or, four or five hours later, we occupied the first city in Germany, which was a city by the name of Zwartov. It still exists, but now it belongs to Poland. That part of area belongs to Poland. And again, no people inside, civilians, no people inside, because they were Russian. The Russian army is coming in, so they, everybody ran away. And they didn't realize that we had strict instru instruction not to hurt anybody, period, period, not anybody. You have, you have your prisoner, you're not supposed to kill him. But unfortunately, people did, whatever it is, you know. Nobody was bragging about it, they did. So that was what was the first thing. In uh, April, in March of, 19, 2nd of March, 1945, 1944, I had a big engagement, our battery had a big engagement against the SS uh, Himmler Division soldiers from the Panzer Division, from the ex Heavenly Panzer thing. And uh, I was uh, extremely lucky not get hit, but I was able to destroy two Nazi tanks with a howitzer, which is not pretty. You have to know what to do it. And I was, I was, you know, educated already. I knew what to do, how a howitzer works. But I was a very lucky shot. I was not the only one which did, but my cannon hit two of them, and I received myself and the lieutenant, which was in charge of my company there, he received cross for bravery and gallantry in the field of glory, which is one of the highest. As a, as a matter of fact, I mentioned the name Marshal Piłsudski. He was the first one getting it, and he got it because he chased the Russian all the way down from Warsaw to Kiev. <laughs> so he got that cross. I was very proud. And I received that cross here. As a matter of fact, there were over 300 people at the council, at the Polish council at the New York City on Madison Avenue. Whole family was there. And my little grandchildren <laughs> looked at me like, you know, like, was it some kind of a thing. So I was, I was very honored to do it, you know. I was not honored of getting medals or something. I was not going for that. I did not take, I got my medals in Poland right after the thing, but I did not want to transport them back to Germany, of course. So I left everything there, and that was the receiving. It started, actually, with my medal started in 1940, 19, 1991, and then ended 1994. It was sent over by, by Lech Walesa, President Lech Walesa, the last one in 1993, but they were waiting for a special occasion to give it to me. So that's almost a trick word of a year. Uh, the, the most brutal war which we had, actually, which not counting, you know, the thing which so many thousands of people die, was in Berlin. Before the Berlin, there was another camp. And this is the first time which I came across human beings in a camp. Sachsenhausen is the name. Sachsenhausen is located approximately 25 miles or 25 kilometers from Berlin. It's a beautiful city. Later after the war, I found out that this city, actually the, the most SS people lived in this city, in Sachsenhausen. And I turned and get the, the German outside, he said, what was going on here? He said, we have gone, they didn't know anything. 
And that camp was actually, it's not a camp which were built in 1940s, that, uh, 1940s, right? Was but when, 1930s, 30, 33 and 34, together with Dachau. They were built for German citizens. And by the way, I found out after the war that Stalin's son, which was a lieutenant, was caught by the Nazis and put in that camp, Sachsenhausen. And when the Russians caught Paulus, you know, Marshal Paulus, they wanted to exchange for Stalin's son. And Stalin said no. So he died in that camp. So that was the end of the camp. Sachsenhausen, of course, when we entered that, we were able to catch two SS guys, which did not have time to run away. They were a little bit older, I don't know. And even so it was against the law, some of us, our guys did it, and uh, they killed them. Those two, two people were hanging, because the two people were still hanging on the outside without down. There were still people laying shot to death. So it was just too much for those guys. And I was not witnessing it. I don't want to see it. But unfortunately, that's what occurred. I think the biggest fights, really, which I had with artillery was in Berlin. And as a matter of fact, we knew, we knew with, with the, uh, the headquarters of Hitler is where he's there. We didn't know that he's there or he's dead or alive. But because I was a Jewish guy, we had the, the privilege. I was the only guy which directed the highway said that the privilege to shot on the end of, of April at the Reichstag there. As right, soon as we crossed the rivers there on the Reichstag. So we had the privilege of shooting on that. We didn't know what's going on. But orders came, we, that's what we did. But that was the biggest obstacle which we had, the fights in Berlin. And after Sachsenhausen, that's what had happened. Just a couple of days later, we were in Berlin and it took us almost two weeks to liquidate that part. And we ended on the 2nd of May, 19, 2nd of May, 3 o'clock in the morning. That was the end of our war. After the war, we, there were still things killing Jews especially the Jews which came back from the camps, because at that time the, the guys took over the apartments. So people which uh, which came back, there was one, uh, I forgot the name, starts with L, with F, I forgot the name. He was a rabbi's son, he was one of the, liber one of the liberators there in Zobibor, and he survived after that. And he came, they came back with a group of five people and one woman. They got that couple were already married in Lublin and they got killed. And after that, the army was hunting the people which did the job. So that was the big shock to us that after the war, they're killing people. And, and it happened also in Kelsa. In Kelsa, there was 42 Jews killed there. And I know that was a division. The soldiers were from the division where my brother-in-law was. That was the second division. The soldiers were stationed there. And they went after them. They killed, they killed them by mass. But 42 Jews, we didn't have too many people left to be killed. So that was very, that was the saddest part of the thing. I didn't mind, you know, go and lose my life and everything. But when somebody survives, why you kill them? So this I could not understand. After so much treachery and everything else, people were still doing mean things, and they still do it to today. And I always preach, I talk a lot to the children and everything else, special lectures at West Point. I'm a lecturing at West Point a lot with the cadets. And with the, with the thing, there were a group last year. I had, one of them was a Congressional Medal of Honor there. And they wanted to know there were 16 of them, special high officers. There were three generals. And they wanted to know the how I did with the how it's a cannon knocked out the tank because they know it's difficult. How it's a goes with a but we were taught. And we were taught. we were not far away. We were one hundred and seventy meters away from those tanks. One hundred and fifty and one hundred and seventy meters away. But we were taught how to do it. You cannot knock out a tank when the tank faces you. The tank has to be to the side, and that's where you knock him. So I was very lucky. I was very lucky. I didn't do better than anybody else. So I think, you know, I believe, you know, and I think God has saved him for me, you know, and uh, he saved me. And that's why, you know, even so, it's very hard to talk about those things, you know, especially the Holocaust stuff and everything else. 
But I think I have a mission, and I think somebody saved me to do things which I should do, because many of people which could do, probably even better than I, educated people, okay, they could do, unfortunately, they're not here to do. Therefore, we have continued to do. And I had the privilege, you know, Nebret International invited me on the 50th anniversary of liberation of Auschwitz to speak at the United Nations. This is the first time I was a commander at that time, not because of commandership, only because what I did. I was invited by the Nebret International and they invited me to speak to there, to the group. I was the first soldier, ex-soldier, to do something like that. So I do a lot of things, you know, which it can improve life, just to let people know and spread that hate is evil and they should not be even in our vocabulary. Even with all that mission here, you know, life is Creator, we have only one creator. Some are Catholic, some are Jews, some, but the creator is the same. The creator is the same. So we have no right to do harm to anybody else because life is very short. And that's what I'm trying to educate Kita. So it's something like that, you know, and that's what I'm doing. I try to persuade not to hate, period. What do you do in your private life? You can do whatever you want, but try to do that. And perhaps perhaps mankind will be better than it was then. That's Bernard Storch, Holocaust survivor, and certainly one of our greatest generation. Thank you so much for sharing your story and helping to put one more brick in the dam against hatred. Hate is evil, and please, please, Talk to your children about it and describe it. You don't have to be, you know, rational, tell them, you know, kill or something like that. Please don't do it. Don't harm anybody else. You don't have to say don't kill. Don't harm anything else, okay? Because harm is evil, you don't do it. So perhaps this way we will be able to, in some way, to change the society. It is so important. We have a beautiful life. Everything is nice. Let's live it in peace. Thank you so much for listening. And thank you. Thank you for examining the world through the prism. This show could not have been made without the help of many. Thanks to our guests, our engineers, Warren Reed, Andre Lupachoff, Brett Fox, and Ryan Troublefield, without whose help and expertise, the prism would certainly sound and look differently. Thanks also to all those who contribute by sending me ideas for the show via email and Facebook. And if you want to hear some of the stories you missed, take a second spin through the prism or leave a comment. You can find archives on the web at voiceofrussia.com slash US. Thank you so much for listening to the prism and for Radio VR in Washington. I'm Andrew Hiller. <laughs>